Dina, I did my doctorate in brain science. I hate to tell you how many decades ago. So you I'm, tell. Not, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> uh, but a lot has happened since uh, I uh, went bad and left the field as a scientist. Uh, what, what can you say in the last few decades have been the great advances in brain science? And since you are both a philosopher and a neuroscientist, step back f for me and, and look at those advances and, and look into the, the deep meaning of them. I actually feel like I left neuroscience just when it was starting to get interesting, too. And luckily, it's not completely irremediable in my case. But um, I think one of the big changes has been the ability to look at the way brains function in awake, normal, mm -hmm. living human beings. And uh, back when I was choosing between philosophy and neuroscience as career choices because I couldn't do both, which is really what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, you could look at people's brains and see the motor strip light up when they moved their finger or something like that. But it was pretty low level stuff. And I was starting to despair that I'd ever be able to ask the kind of questions that I wanted to ask. And so I thought, well, at least I can ask those questions in philosophy. <laughs> um, but now we can really ask some of those questions in neuroscience. And, uh, and it's really, really interesting. Um, but it's also really hard. So, What are some uh, examples? So maybe the, f the first big breakthrough, in a sense, was putting people in the scanner and having them make moral judgments and looking at this really complicated activity and being able to see what parts of the brain are active mm. when people make certain kinds of moral judgments. Now, there's lots of, of uh, dispute about exactly what we should take away from those kinds of studies, and, and they're difficult studies because when you have people making complicated judgments uh, with different kinds of stimuli, you have lots of differences in brain activity, and it's pretty uncontrolled, and so it's hard to know exactly what you can conclude from it. But um, but I think we we can make some conclusions from studies like that, and they're they're really interesting. Um, and that was the first indication to me that you could actually look at some of the the complicated uh, cognitive processes that I was really interested in, and start to see what parts of the brain are doing what. Um, but you know, neuroimaging is D dig a little deeper on that. So for for moral feelings and brain structure, I mean, what, what do you see? What can you point to as an advance in thinking specifically? Well, for one thing, uh, we can see that when people make certain kinds of judgments, um, judgments that doing harm is bad, for instance, mm -hmm. that uh, there are parts of the brain that are usually involved in emotional uh, reactions that are active. Uh, and so it does give us at least a little bit of insight into the kinds of processes that are involved in moral thinking. Uh, and, and it suggests that moral thinking, at least as normal people do it, is not a purely rational process. Oh, okay. Okay, so contra people like Kant, um, who say that moral thinking is, is purely rational, it suggests that, well, in fact, in many human beings, that's not the case. Now, what Kant actually said, though, is that it should be purely rational. And so the fact that people don't think purely rationally when they make these judgments could also be just the fact, could, could be an indication that Kant is right and people do it wrong. Um, and so I think there's still, people tend to get confused about the difference between the descriptive aspect of science and the normative aspect of philosophy. And it's, uh, I think that's led to a lot of confusion. Uh, how does this uh, impact the, uh, uh, the, the relationship between free will and moral judgment if you've now shown that uh, emotions, uh, which we don't have conscious control over, we may affect it consciously, but your emotions can affect decision making. Uh, how does that uh, relate? Does that, does that um, degrade the level of, of free will and moral decisions? I don't think so. Uh, so again, I would say um, it's really, there's no reason to think that we have to have control over every aspect of our decision making in order to freely choose. 
And we know we don't have control over all kinds of things. We don't have control over our genetics. We don't have control over our upbringing. We don't have a lot of control over our environment. Uh, and so the fact that there are parts of our brain that we don't have control over also doesn't seem to, to make it impossible to have free will. Well, let me give you two points in time. Point A is in your life and career when you, we didn't know before those studies were done, that the emotional yeah. parts of the brain were, were involved in moral decisions. We didn't know that. You said we've just learned that. Well, people had, we know people that. had but now ideas know, from other, but other now, ways. But, but to, you didn't but, know that. And now you know it for sure. Yeah. And doesn't that affect how you think or redefine free will? I don't think so. So I still think, first of all, the fact that those areas are active doesn't necessarily mean that they are controlling. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't modulate them if we decide that the decision that, that is prompted by our emotional response is the wrong one. Uh, so I think there's a lot about free will that has to do with these uh, higher level executive processes and our ability to control our own reactions. And ultimately, what we're interested in is what are our actions, not what are our judgments or our thoughts. Uh, well, certainly from so, a legal point of view, from a philosophical point of view, I think we're interested in, in all of it. In, right. But from a legal point of view, do you ever envision a time where uh, brain scans can be used in some uh, legal forensic uh, a approach to, uh, uh, to whether a person was fully responsible for their actions in a free will sense? Um, my prediction is it's not that far off. Yeah, that was the question. Was, but is that good? I mean, is it? Is it? it, it if it will be, is it, is that a legitimate use? I think it really depends a lot on what the circumstances are, what the science, the state of the science is at that point. But in principle, the, it it can be used. You're saying. I think that there will be there will be cases in which we will be able to say this person did not have the capacity to responsibly make decisions. Well, we certainly uh, could do that if, 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 I think if we, we can show do that the brain now, now with, the, with dementia or some sort exactly. of a severe problem. Right. And so we're getting better at... And so the bar comes it, down in terms of, uh, or, or, or the fine grain approach of, of the science makes us be able to, to adjudicate more complicated cases. So, yeah. so, so what we're doing is we're increasing the number of cases that would be subject uh, to um, uh, that the person was not in control of their own faculties, right? Are we increasing that? I don't know, actually. I think what we're doing is moving the gray area. Um, and it's not, it's not clear to me whether we're going to increase the number. Uh, I think if we increase the number too much with the imaging will just change the standards of what kinds of capacities are required for responsible action. So I, I don't think these things are completely independent. Mm -hmm. So no matter what the images say, you still have to make some kind of normative decision that isn't going to come out of the images alone about what's our standard for responsible behavior. When is somebody so, uh, so impaired that they can't be held responsible or they are, you know, given a lighter sentence or whatever. And when are we just going to hold the line and say, that's still good enough. So, so that decision doesn't go away just because we have more fine grained ways of looking at the brain. But basically we have these two poles of, of uh, understanding free will and understanding moral responsibility and judgment. And now you have a new mechanism for looking at both. Yeah. So free will is one component of moral responsibility. That is, we want people to make their own decisions, not under constraints, um, and be able to control their actions or have the capacity to control their actions in a normal kind of way. But there are also other things. Uh, you know, a person who lacks a certain degree of intelligence, we're not going to hold them responsible in the same degree, to the same degree. Uh, a person who has dementia, we're not going to hold responsible to the same degree. So there are a bunch of different capacities, I think, that go into making an agent a responsible agent. And we have to decide how much of those various capacities we need in order to consider someone fully responsible.
but I think that, that those kinds of questions will come up more and more uh, when we have to start making more fine-grained decisions about whether this deficit is a sufficient deficit to get a person off or, or lessen their punishment for particular crimes.